be a $20 million company, even though you have a great idea and a great team. Um, or their valuation is sometimes too low. And they, I was like, why are you probably, you're undercutting yourself? Because I just see a lot of deals. So I see so many deals that I can accurately judge. So it's a market, and it changes. These things are not fixed. Right now, we're in high. You're not going to get better than this. We're in great times. Valuations are very high now. These are good times. It's a competitive market. Entrepreneurs who have uh, you know, traction are in the driver's seat. They can, they can command their valuation. That's why you're seeing these unicorns out there because of that. So, um, so, so the bottom line is uh, go out to the market, uh, talk to experienced people, get into AngelList if you can as an investor, look at, and the market will show you pretty closely. Like this startup is, at, is relatively at my stage and they're the same type of company, and I see 10 of them going at this valuation. Yeah, that's pretty much what I can probably get away with. And you know, some of it depends on time, too. Do you want the money fast? Well, cut your valuation a little. You know, get investors in there faster. Or do you want to, um, do you want to maximize your valuation? Not always the best decision, because time is money. Remember, acceleration, speed to market, all these things count often more than the cash you get. So it's not always the best deal. It's how quickly you can move. So you don't want to be stingy and say, well, if I, I could wait another three months and get a better valuation, might not be better because there may be somebody who gets funded and pushes past you, gets the spotlight put on them, and then you're in the position of trying to catch up to them and being looked at as a copycat even though you were first. That didn't do you any good, say, getting that few million dollars more on your valuation. It actually probably killed your company. So you want to factor in all those things. And you'll never know for sure. We all make mistakes. But yes? Yes. Oh, well, it, OK, great question. How do you get a venture capitalist to be your advisor? Um, it, more likely, it would be an angel investor or a smart business person. Sometimes you go to an accelerator program for that. Like we run Founder Space. You know, we advise companies on their valuation and all these things. And we connect them up with different mentors who are venture capitalists who come into the accelerator to work with startups. Um, uh, there are lots of ways. But you have to hustle, right? You have to either get into an acceleration program or talk to a lot of people. Um, uh, you can even find out valuations right here in the room. You know, talk to you, the more people you talk to, and you get online. A lot of this information is online. So um, you won't always get a VC who's your advisor. I mean, you're lucky if you do, but um, you, there's a lot of other sources out there. Okay. Oh, what were we on? Oh, tap your ecosystem. So, um, so do you like these pictures? Are these relevant? Like the woman with the paper airplanes? You know why that's up there, right? Everybody knows why that's up there. Well, use your imagination. Um, tap your ecosystem. So uh, the idea here is there is a, uh, your ecosystem is the best way for you to get knowledge and funding for your company initially. It's way better than venture capitalists that you probably don't have relationships with. It's way better than angel investors that you, you know, probably don't know and are just trying to get them to invest. Your ecosystem is everybody in your, uh, who benefits from what you're building. So if you're building a product that uh, is in the auto industry, right? And it is this new cool thing for cars, this IoT device for cars, let's say, you know, that comes onto a car and does something fancy that cars never thought they could do. Well, who benefits from this? Is it car dealers? Who are the parts distributors? Who would you be ordering from the different manufacturers who would be building your product? Who would be uh, that, um, you know, all the different channels? Who would be different vendors you would use? Everybody in that ecosystem could be, because they could understand, they can see what you're building. They understand what you're doing. They will give you feedback. They, will, they, may, they may actually be the first investors in your company. Because they were like, oh my God, you, you figured out something with cars, you know? And then maybe people do aftermarket car stuff, you know? And it's this rich guy who owns this aftermarket car thing, and you're going to be giving this to the, the aftermarkets. And he's, and he's like, okay, I'll put in 50 grand, and then I'll get, you know, and then you go to 10 other of those guys, right? And they all put in money because they see that this is really cool and they want to be in, in a startup. And they aren't the type of people who usually get approached by entrepreneurs. You know, think about it. You, you run, you know, you install stereos and all this cool stuff aftermarket in cars. How many uh, companies come and pitch you a year? Maybe none. Maybe you're the only one that walks in there. But they also watch Silicon Valley on TV and see the whole thing. So, you know, and, they, and if they're doing well, they have some extra cash. And they might be the ones to step in and fund you. 
Now, I look at this, like with medical health devices, all these health things out there, don't raise from angels in Silicon Valley. Like if you're doing a new uh, wearable health or some, you know, some health device. Though the angels in Silicon Valley, they see a gazillion deals, right? As soon as they, they've seen, you know, uh, 30 things last week and next, after they see you, they'll see 30 things next week. For them to choose you, you're, you're one out of, you know, they might do five investments a year. So, and they've seen hundreds. So the chance is very low that they're going to fund you. And they're jaded and they ask all the hard questions you don't want to answer. And, you know? <laughs> um, but if you go to doctors, like outside Silicon Valley, like in Los Angeles or Sacramento or Peoria or wherever you're from, you know, go to doctors and the, you have this cool medical thing, you're probably the first startup that ever approached them about this. And they, everybody believes like when it's their domain that they're smart in it, right? So they're like, oh yeah, this is my, I should invest in this because it's my area. And they're passionate about it because that's what they do for a living. So go to those pe people who have enough wealth, right? They can't be like, um, you know, if you're making an app for busboys, you're not going to be raising money from busboys. You know, they're just not going to be writing you big checks. They're not accredited investors, let's face it, right? But, you know, if, if there are people in your ecosystem who have money, approach them. Approach them. Even if they don't buy your stuff, you're making a relationship with them. You can get their feedback. You can do deals. You can do this. Spend a lot of time figuring out your ecosystem. I had a startup that raised a huge amount of money, and all they had was... Uh, um, all they had was uh, a, a little video and some data. A little video. So they did warehouse optimization, and they, instead of coding anything, they went through the whole warehouse, and they, uh, they timed themselves with timer, and, they, and their app that they made, they did with pen and paper, guiding people through the warehouse more efficiently, how to do the packing and stuff. And then um, they went to their ecosystem. So they went to all the people who own warehouses and started to engage with different companies who had warehouses. And, and the people who made the hardware, they got them to introduce them to these companies because they would be selling their hardware into these, their specialized hardware into these warehouses, and, no, to the customers who would, who would use it for their, the app they were creating. And they did all this, they got all those people involved in helping them. They ended up getting two major players, like, you know, they, they, they got, basically they went to Toyota, Pfizer, Walmart, you know, all these huge companies, you know, Tesla, all those companies were excited about what they did because they had the data. They had real data to show they, it could make that where each warehouse worker 15% more efficient and they translated that into time as money, right? And the biggest cost center in warehouses is people. So they took that data, they went to them, they got them excited, they showed them a little video of how it would actually work, and then two of them put down $25,000 checks for just the prototype. They didn't even have a prototype, right? So they were like, we need to sell this internally. We need a prototype. And they were like, well, it cost you 25K, you know, because they had no money. <laughs> they wrote $25,000 checks. They built the prototype. And then even before they delivered the prototype, they went out to investors. They raised 1.5 million. I, I was helping them. They raised 1.5 million, and they were oversubscribed. They shut down the round, you know, less than six months later, another 1.5 million. So three million bucks on, on, on data. Um, tapping their ecosystem, right, and, and uh, getting a check in the mail, getting, getting customer validation. Yeah. Oh, so for them it was just timing people, how efficient can they make them move through the warehouse if they're using their special app. So the yeah. performance metrics. Well, basically, yeah, they, they'd say, you normally do your job with a clipboard and it takes you this long. With what we're doing, we measure the time it takes you to do the getting package movement from here, there, everything, and we save 15% of your time. That's all they had to show. So, I don't know if that applies to every one of your businesses, but it can apply to a lot of yours. The data is more important than the product. That, that what you understand about your customer and what you can do for them, that's important. And then getting the customer to pay for it, right? The validation, really important. Uh, know your hypothesis. I'm not going to go into this. We have too little time. Simulate your business. I just told you that. That, that was a great example of simulating a business, the one with the warehouse. They didn't build code anything. They just mocked it up and went straight to customers. Yes? Um, going back to the investors, yeah. um, local investors, yeah. what's in it for them? Local investors? Like uh, investors or uh, angel investors or um, uh, the local small entities. Okay. Oh, they all want to make money. So there's two things in it for them. People invest for three reasons. One, financial. I want a financial return. I want to get rich. 
Two, which is equal and sometimes more important, ego. A lot of the angel investors in Silicon Valley are all about, rich people are all about, I want to be, say I was in on the next Twitter right, or, or Uber. They bra it's bragging rights to their friends. So they're out to show that they were so smart that they got in on the next Uber like when it was a tiny company. Three, strategic. Those are the only three reasons that I can think of that people invest. It adds strategic value to what they do. Like best, best people you can raise money from now are like corporate, strategic people. They have the money, and if they see that you can really help them, they don't care a lot of times even if they get a financial return. Because it at, in their business, it, it, will, it, it makes their business, they'll get other returns within their business. By your piece will make them more efficient. If you can make them more efficient, if you can hit... Uh, hit their bottom line, it doesn't matter if you're successful, like it doesn't matter if you're a unicorn, they, even if you're moderately successful, you're built feeding their ecosystem and, and helping them make more money. So as yeah. a founder, yeah. you'll be offering a share then for your company to this investor? Of course. So I always recommend convertible notes at the beginning. Even better are the safe notes that they have. Uh, they're like convertibles, but without, you know, it, you can just look it up. It's a, it's a whole other lecture. <laughs> but I, I, I recommend um, convertible notes over equity priced rounds because they're very quick. On a convertible note, you can literally hand somebody a note and you can specify two things. It's so simple. A convertible note, there's uh, the discount, which means that if you, uh, if, and there's the cap. So the cap I'll explain first because it works this way. So the cap is the maximum a, the, the maximum that their note will convert at. So let's say you give a, 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 an investor a $4 million cap, and then they invest, and then the company all of a sudden gets a Series A priced round from a VC at $20 million. Well, all their shares convert at $4 million. So they get a great deal, right? They're not paying at a tw for a $20 million company. They're paying like it was a $4 million company. So that's what they want. Now, if you sell, if end up closing your priced round later at $3 million instead of four. Then they get that their, the discount, which might be is typically 20%. But the beautiful thing about a convertible note is that for every investor you hand it to, you can change the cap. You can change, usually you leave it at 20% discount, that's pretty standard, but you can change the cap. You are not required, like a price round, there are all these rules, SEC rules about it that you have to follow. But on a, on a note, you can literally change the cap all over the place and, until you do a priced round. So the beauty of that is if there's a strategic investor, somebody who adds an incredible amount of value, you could give them a lower cap than you gave somebody else. Now, you may piss off your other investors, right? They're like, hey, you told me this was $8 million. You're giving it to that guy for six. What, you know, what's the deal? So you have to have a reason to justify it. Um, one reason could be we really needed the money. <laughs> you know? But whatever it is, um, you are legally free to do whatever you want, which means you can also, like whenever you go to a meeting with investors, you have your convertible notes ready to go because I like to close. And this is a whole other talk, so I won't go into it. But I like to just say, hey, I'm going to send you the convertible note tomorrow. Let me know if you're interested. And if they don't respond right away, and, and I'll also send you the due diligence package. And you let me know within a week if you're interested. And if they don't respond, you just move on. Yes? Did you say safe note, S-A-F-E? Yeah, yeah. So it's on there. It's a Y Combinator developed it. Okay. Um, it's a, basically like a convertible note without the loan piece. Without, they can't, you don't have to pay them back. It just converts automatically to equity. So, at, so it, it's just a little simpler. But like, you know, I deal with a lot of Chinese investors, so we have tons of them coming into founder space now to invest in our startups because they have money. And uh, in China, the valuations are higher than Silicon Valley. It's crazy right now. So they're coming here looking for, for bargains in startups. And um, they, like, they don't even really understand convertible notes. They all want to do price rounds. Because they're like, well, I don't really know what that is. You know? So it depends who you're, who you're working with. Um, and the safe notes are even less understood. So, so you've got to tailor your investment vehicle to your investors. Engage customers. I kind of went over that. Um, I want to talk about looking into their eyes. So this is really important. When, whenever you engage anybody, whether it's a customer, a venture capitalist, um, you know, an advisor, Watch their eyes, right? And when you say something, don't just be thinking about what you're going to say next so you can appear smart or powering it through your PowerPoint. You know, really 
uh, watch how they react because certain things will make them light up. You know when people light up, like they're kind of just sitting back and all of a sudden they're leaning forward and like paying attention? That, that is really, uh, that is, those are your golden nuggets. So you want to mentally be recording in every pitch you do how your customer or whether it's a, or VC or whoever you're pitching to is responding. And edit, edit those, like go back. So like every time I raised a lot of money, but I did it by constantly, my pitching was never done. I would, I would basically, every time I drove home from a pitch, whether it's a customer pitch or, or an investor pitch, I, I replay the whole pitch in my mind and go, wow, that worked, that didn't. Okay, and if I see the don'ts enough time, I remove it from my pitch, totally out of my pitch. And if I see, every time I see somebody's eyes light up, I use it again and again and again. So, you know, my presentation now, might seem pretty polished, but because I keep editing. Like even now, I look like, when are people paying attention? Like, are, are they bored? <laughs> Am I boring you? But um, so whenever you engage, that's, I can't tell you how important it is. Your deck and your pitch should never be static. You should always, you know how you, we're supposed to be uh, creative and innovative on our products? We'll be just as creative and innovative on your sales pitch and your investor pitch. Throw stuff out there that you've never thrown out there before. Try weird things. So every time I'm, I give a lecture, every time I pitch my company or my accelerator, I always say something weird or something different, just different, so that then I can look into their eyes and see if I got, if I got a golden nugget that I use again. So, but, and it also keeps you awake because there's nothing more boring than going out and giving the same pitch over. I mean, I'm sure you've all felt this. You know, you go out there and you have to like, Oh, I have to give the same pitch. And you find yourself, your voice gets kind of dull because you're like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're like, you're monotony, you know, you're just a tape recorder, right? So make it fun for yourself. Do like jumping jack, whatever you have to do, you know, just, you know, in the pitch. Like, so one, one startup I know, this really crazy guy, you know, he's like living in a trailer home. He has no money, nothing. He used to be kind of this uh, YouTube star, but he was like, he had uh, that fame had passed, you know? <laughs> His 15 seconds was over on YouTube, where he's no longer a star, nobody cares about him. And he's there, and he comes up with this idea, this crazy idea for this music service or something. Um, and and uh, he emails Tim Draper, this huge email, right? And I don't know why Tim responded to this. Most VCs want like just three lines of email. But this rambling email about what he's doing, and he has this team he got together and everything. And Tim says, oh, okay, come into my office tomorrow, not knowing the guy is like off in the Midwest somewhere, like Minnesota, right? <laughs> so the guy's literally like, okay, we gotta get our plane ticket, you know? <laughs> and so he gets his whole team together. He like, and then he gets to, you know, Tim Draper's office. And most of you know him, he's this big uh, venture capitalist here. And then he has one of his guys dress up in like this crazy bird costume or something. And then the other guy's carrying this boom box. And, and then they just go prancing into the office, you know? And they're like, ah, yeah, and they're, because they're this music startup. And they're just acting weird and crazy, you know? And they walk out of there with $400,000. <laughs> they didn't have anything else. <laughs> just just they, they made Tim's day a little brighter. They did something different, right? <laughs> they woke him up. They didn't pull up the PowerPoint and like just show him another boring PowerPoint that everybody was showing him. So he thought they had something. And he's sort of a wild guy, too. But um, so all I'm saying is that don't, ju don't uh, do the same thing everybody's doing. Just in, in your pitches, in your sales thing, think of something weird to do. Think creatively. Like, my company is about golf clubs. What weird thing can we do with golf clubs, you know? Can I have people like doing, you know, uh, Charlie Chaplin with a golf club or something, you know, something fun, you know, with this cane thing and all that. But I just made that up. But just, just think of, just think, make it fun. These guys get bored. If, you, if you're a venture capitalist, man, you are sitting, or even a customer, a corporate customer, you are sitting listening. To, you want to talk to another vendor if you're a corporate customer. If you're a venture capitalist, you're hearing pitches all day long, every day. They all look and sound the same. Make yours a little fun. That's why I put these weird pictures on here, right? Some of them make sense, like this owl sort of makes sense. Some of them kind of didn't, but I didn't really care. They go like, at least they like, hopefully woke you up a little, right? Every time I change slides, you, you know, you have something to look at. Like, well, that's kind of boring, but um, we could go to the next one. Oh, that's a little better. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think, and you notice how I put very few words on here? Another tip for you guys when you're pitching, uh, less is more, right? 
because you're not reading the slide, you're looking at me. I don't want you like, like a lot of people put all this text on their slides, and then everybody in the room, the venture capitalists are like trying to read and they're not listening. It's hard to read and listen. You end up like not really reading and not really listening. So uh, what we want you to do is kind of glance at this, be visually entertained, and I didn't even put that much time, I could add animation and stuff, but that ends up being distracting too, right? So it's something you know, that stimulates you visually, and, and, you know, and that stimulates your whole brain going, keeps you awake. And then I, a few key words that kind of summarize what I'm doing. Now, your investor pitch deck should be different than your investor deck. Most people use the same thing. Yes, that's easier. Is that a good idea? No, 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 no. Because then your investor deck is something you, ah, oh, I'm running out of time already. Um, your investor deck is something you send out for them to read because they won't meet with you, right? You never send it to them unless they ask for it, but they won't meet with you, they, so they want to screen you, so you send that, right? But this is something that, this is a pitch deck. So make two separate decks, one super simple and visual, and one with more words because you won't be in the room to explain it to them. Never use the same one. I'm going to go a little fast. Um, don't chase losers. I already kind of told you that earlier in the thing. If something's bad, drop it. You know, don't run after it. And it, you like that picture, right? Pretty. <laughs> and this, the colors are all off. These are actually much better pictures, but the colors are horrible on this projector. IDM, spend some money. Um, <laughs> pivot, kill, pivot, kill. Um, truth is ugly. So <laughs> it woke you up, right? <laughs> but truth is ugly. It's always going to hurt. So just embrace it. Embrace the ugliness of truth, right? It's never what you want to, uh, seldom, it's not always what you want to hear, but that's a good thing. If you're feeling pain when you're hearing it, instead of trying to shut it down like we usually do because it contradicts everything, you know, put up, a, make a mental note, ha, I'm feeling pain, Ma, there's something here, I want to spend time with it, right? I want to figure out what, why I'm, I'm rejecting this idea. Uh, it's what you learn throughout the process, most important thing, everything you do, it should be about learning. I'm always a person who's trying to teach myself. So um, every, the reason I love running an accelerator is because I find I learn more from the startups often than they do from me. Because these startups are, well, first of all, it's easier to spot other people's mistakes than your own. <laughs> it's always like, you're, what, what are you doing? I never see my own mistakes, like I'm doing the same stupid thing over and over. Um, but also, startup founders are so smart. And there's so many creative, great ideas out there around so many new industries. For me, it's like super exciting, right? There's so much to digest. The world is changing so fast. And every time I engage with a startup founder, they're teaching me about their business, about you know, a medical device, a new you know, invention, an AI, whatever it is. It's really fun. Um, do that yourself. I think it's great. Um, failure isn't death. <laughs> so there's a lot more I could say, but we have so short time. But um, you never fail, right, in life. There really is no failure until you really die, right? You're, you haven't failed until you're just like not on this earth. So if you read, and I'm a huge uh, history buff, so I read about all these historical figures and all this stuff around the world. The, the, the ones who succeed are the, in, in the biggest way that we remember 100,000 years later are the ones who totally failed. Like I'm reading a book right now. I always like, whenever I'm driving, I have a book on. So right now I have a, a book about the history of Jesus as a man. Like who, what he really was as a person. It's called Jesus the Zealot or something. Brilliant book, very historical. But you know, Jesus, there were tons of messiahs in, in Israel around the time of Jesus. I hope I'm not offending him. These are just facts, right? There are many messiahs who came before him who were crucified. Many, they were crucifying people every day. And the Romans occupied Israel, right? They were crucifying people literally every day. And when you're crucified, you are a failed Messiah because the Messiah was the person who was supposed to be the, the chosen one by God to come back and restore the kingdom of David to Israel. That's what the, it doesn't mean God. That came later. That came like, you know, 60 years after uh, Jesus' death, that whole concept. But at the time, the Messiah in, to Jewish people in Israel was all about uh, liberating Israel from the Romans. They were, being, they were an occupied nation, and they were having a bloody revolt, and the Romans were cracking down and crucifying people. So when Jesus got crucified, he had all of a sudden failed. He was a failed Messiah. So he failed and he died, right? But his, his, his disciples lived on, and then they changed the whole story because they couldn't have him a failed Messiah, so he had to be God, and he had to have sacrificed his life, and that's why he had to come back from the dead because if he came back from the dead, he wasn't really a failure because he was still alive, and that meant the kingdom of God was going to come because, but it just hadn't come yet, and we're still waiting for that, but it's going to come. Um, 
And, and uh, all of this is, uh, I mean, it's historical fact, right? This is how it was. And because uh, uh, Jesus, well, I'm, I could just talk too long. I'm just <laughs> I don't really need to give you the whole history there. <laughs> Let me go on. You only need one winner, and that's the key, right? In your whole life, you only need one winner, right? So if you can stay, along, uh, stay alive long enough, you know, or maybe if you have some disciples that follow you after you're dead, <laughs> then, then you might get that winner. You know, Jesus got it after he's dead. So he did one thing, right? He got, he got a bunch of people to believe in him, right? He was a great leader. He was an amazing leader. Like these people just kept going um, and changing the story until they captured the world's imagination. Yes? Sorry, what's the name of the book? Oh, Jesus the Zealot. So it's pretty, it's like an amazing book. It's like, it blew my mind. I never knew this. But I'm always reading weird books that are out of like the ordinary. Like I'll pick up anything and just read it. Um, uh, so the, here's one thing I want to give you. And this is Live the Dream. Uh, uh, this should be fun, right? Like, look, you're never going to fail. I already told you that until you die. And even then you can succeed, right? If you get enough followers who believe in what you did. Um, uh, uh, so just have fun, right? This should be fun. You're doing your startup. You're living the dream. You're here. You could be out earning like six figures, a great job, but you're not doing that. <laughs> so enjoy it, like, and enjoy the failures. Enjoy all these crazy times because this is what you wanted to do. Remember, don't blame anybody. Don't get mad at VCs when they don't call you back. Don't, you know, just like laugh, just like whatever, you know, this is fun. So I, I really want you to take that to heart. Um, this, I want to talk a little about this. We just launched this at Founderspace. It's called foundersedge.com. It's, I'm meeting tons of corporations now that want to connect with startups. So they're totally, uh, they're, corporate funding was like $12.4 billion last year. People don't know that. Every corporation can't innovate, right? They're like worried about de being disrupted, so they're pumping tons of money into startups. And they will do it. They come to me and they say, Steve, I don't care if I get any financial return out of my investments. Whoa, don't we all love that, right? <laughs> you don't even care. <laughs> you, know, you don't even want your money back. They go, I just want strategic fits, and we want to engage them in our kind of open innovation so you know, we can collaborate and learn and build stuff together. So they are putting in lots of money to startups. So what we, we have launched a site where we connect startups with corporate investors. So you sign up there. You might not get a call back right away, but we're always checking. And when a corporation comes to us and there's an exact fit, then we make that connection. So when we see that what you have is what they need, we'll make that, and then it's up to you guys. We don't even take a fee, it's all free. It's, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really, really cool and, and timely. And then I wanna put this up and I'll answer a few more questions, but I'm Steve at founderspace.com. So you can email me questions, I do respond. Um, this is my real email. <laughs> it's my name, it's there. And uh, so you- Pause very quickly. Yeah, Rob knows. So I'm super responsive. I can't always go out to coffee with everybody because um, I'm really, really busy. So I, even if I love you, I'll, I'll, often I'll hand you off to somebody in our organization to work with. Don't be offended. Um, but I will answer your question if you make it brief, right? If you say, Steve, you know, I just want to ask you one thing, right? I'll, I'll do my best or I'll connect you with somebody if I can connect you. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so feel free to contact me. I'm gonna, I have a bunch of cards up here. If you don't have a phone to take a picture, you can grab a card. I'm going to have to run right after this meeting because I have to be somewhere else tonight. Um, so uh, I won't be able to stick around, but I'll answer your questions now, hopefully, if you have any more. Yeah, well, first, yeah. Let's hear Steve for thoughts. Whoa, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So stay in your seats. Jan is going around the ball. We have lots of prizes from our sponsors, but in the meantime, we'll take some weird questions. Yeah. You got a weird question? Yeah. Hi, Steve. Yeah. Uh, if you got an idea, you know that the idea is most potential. What? Another, let's suppose you got an idea. An idea, yeah. You see that the idea is more potential in the market. So, what are the first three steps? I mean, what are the three steps you need to do? Okay, so you have an idea, has a lot of potential in the market. What's the first three things you're going to do? Okay, you're giving me a hard one here. Um, so first thing to do is really figure out what, who your customer is, number one. Who is my customer? Who is going to use this or buy this? That's your number one thing. Number two, um, go to that customer. <laughs> Ask them if they really want, what, if they really think your idea is as great as you think it is. 
So you just sit down and talk to them at the beginning. You don't have to do anything. Like the more time you spend with your customer, the better. Number three, um, get that feedback from the customer, that data, and uh, make, uh, develop your idea a little. 